good relatives. This is Faith Spotted Eagle. My, uh, I want to practice the first principle of Nitue, who are you? And so not to rave on about myself, but to let you know who I am. Uh, my English name is Faith Spotted Eagle. My Dakota name is Tokan Pia Najimi, which is Standing Stone. And I descend from a very strong um, warrior Kunshi from Minnesota. She was Bidea Wakantua. And she um, did her vision in Minnesota, and then the Minnesota Wars came. And so she was displaced and exiled and ended up in Crow Creek. And so that's who I represent among any many other relatives in my kinship. And I am an enrolled member of the Ihangto and Dakota on, in southeastern South Dakota along the Missouri River. But I am a member of several bands or descended from the Dewa Kantuya, Hunkati, Sichangu, and uh, Hunkapa. So I'm really excited. That's who I am. And I certainly wish I could have attended and seen all of you in person. But I know Creator will provide another time for us to accomplish that. So I want to enjoy these few minutes with you and, and the facilitators, the hosts, feel free to rein me in if I get too long uh, on the wind. So I wanted to share with you and I'll pretend I'm by the fireside with you tonight. I can feel the heat, the warmth, the love. And I'm gonna talk about five or six things and I will try to do it swiftly so I don't take all of your time. And I understand Sister Sharon Day is gonna be there. So I put up my hands to her and my love to her. And I don't wanna to infringe too much on her time, but I wanna talk about five or six things. I wanna talk about uh, the concept of Wachiniyapi, which is call of the people and what that means for environmental leadership. Because my comments tonight are gonna to talk about what does it mean to stand in the space of environmental leadership? And leadership doesn't always mean leading, it could be following. Secondly, the healing transformation that comes about when you engage in these spaces and recognize. The third is it falls into knowing your role. What is your role in this transformation space of standing by the environment? in a humble way. Fourth, you always have to assess the battlefield. What, and you can't go in there without data, knowledge, humility, and an idea of why you're there. Fifth, uh, spiritual activism goes beyond ourselves. We're here for a reason. And the example that I've learned, many examples over my lifetime of 74 years, I just turned 74 last week. I'm pretty happy about that. Um, and the KXL pipeline was probably one of my growing times, which I just came out of 12 years of activism. The sixth is the good relative. In the midst of all of this coming to a summary point is that it makes it um, attainable when we remember that we are just one of the good relatives in nature and all the nations that we are working with and are privileged to stand with. I remember my uncle, Albert Whitehat told me one time we were driving together and we worked together in doing a lot of uh, PTSD work in the VA with the soldiers. And we drove by this field and there was a whole bunch of hawks. I mean, like hundreds, maybe thousands of hawks. And he said, oh, look at this. It's a gathering of a nation. He said, anytime you are in the presence of a gathering of a nation, you are blessed. And so I wanted you to keep in mind because a lot of these nations are gathering that do not have voices in these spaces that we're talking about and we have to speak for them and hopefully I can do that today. So the big call to leadership that I got uh, in along with the many in my path of 74 years happened 12 years ago, 13 years ago, 14 years ago with the KXL movement, I realized that nobody was responding. The first time I heard about the KXL movement was at a treaty meeting in Rapid City. And it was Mario Gonzalez. And he came to a treaty meeting and he said, my relatives pay attention. He said, this monster KXL is coming from Montana and it's gonna go all the way to the Gulf. And he said, nobody's saying anything. And that was the very first time I heard about it about 14 or 15 years ago. And I thought, I gotta pay attention because this is gonna affect my river. And so I began researching it. There wasn't much out there. And then I thought the call to leadership is that none of the tribal councils, none of the leadership, the 
treaty councils, nobody's stepping up. So I thought, well, we have a Chanteo Hitika, we have a Braveheart Society, and we have our treaty. I'm the chair of the treaty uh, committee and Mike Oyanke. So we called for a, a meeting called uh, to create a treaty called the International Treaty to Protect the Sacred at Fort Randall. And I believe Frankie Jackson, who is uh, here with you tonight, was there. But we put out a call for all the leaders, and leader meant common people too, anybody who cared about the water and our land, and to come. And we created, we got the permission of our general council, which was an amazing feat to get the people to agree to this international treaty, because some people said, we don't, they don't allow us to sign treaties anymore. And this is where you take your power back. And I said, they said that, but this is we. We can sign any treaties that we want with other indigenous nations and international entities. So we created this international treaty to protect the sacred against tar sands and KXL and uh, got the advice of um, Walter Echohawk and other people who showed up, other attorneys that came. And we created this document and eventually we had 10 First Nations sign it. We had the Oglala, the Kudwichasha, uh, Kuwichasha, Ihangtu of the Ocheti Shakoin, and others that came in, like the Pawnee Nation. We made friends with them, our traditional enemies. And so it was a treaty of peace and standing up, and it was a call to Ozuya. It was warrior time. And so it took from the time that we did that treaty until KXL was dead, which was just a few more short months uh, ago, the PUC actually took it off as a given permit in the state of South Dakota. Uh, it took over 12 years. I have a grandson who was 12 years old by the time that the KXL was dead, so he was born into this fight. We kept our eye on the prize, and it was not easy. There were times that we fell into conflict. We canceled some things, and we almost canceled Reject to the Protect, which was in Washington, D.C., before the Capitol because of cultural differences. But um, that's when we turned to nature with prayers and remembered. The other thing, when I say that cultural diversity is the same thing as biological diversity, every discipline comes into play. And in the KXL pipeline battle, one of the principles that we focused on in our area of the river was the uh, dung beetle. Um, this is, was a endangered species and KXL people, TransCanada minimized it. They said, oh, very few are gonna be affected, but very few are still here. And so we, we researched it, we made relationship, we offered tobacco and we come to re remember that the dumb beetles travels by star knowledge, real deep knowledge. And so these government, natural ecosystem governance systems are so intense beyond our own intelligence as human beings that we are, it makes you feel, uh, I don't wanna say unworthy, it makes you feel like a, a child just now learning how to tie your shoes. It's even getting involved in the national park, we're trying to indigenize the national park system. We have some wonderful indigenous people in there, Chuck Sands, who is the head of the National Park Service. We just had a visit last week from Dorothy Firecloud, who has worked her way from superintendents in two parks up to national liaison leadership in national parks. So we're in blessed times where we can take back, uh, it's like park back, land back of those places that the parks where we had ceremonies we had memories, we still have uh, that Frankie talked about with traditional cultural properties, massive traditional cultural properties in these parks that need to be designated. But there's enough work out there for all of you uh, in this room. And so I'd like to um, conclude like a good relative and not take too much of your time. And as I close, I just wanna throw out a wish, prayer and a thought for our children because our children, if they've grown up with activists like my children have, it is a great burden because there are many hours that I robbed them of. And so I constantly apologize, but guess what? They're activists. And so uh, they understand. And now the grandchildren are uh, doing some amazing things. They're only uh, 22, uh, 
nine and four, but they are going to be amazing, and I'm thankful. So there it is.